If gender is a social construct, then for the duration of this video, I identify as a woman. A lesbian woman. So if you try to dismiss my arguments because I'm mansplaining, you're actually being transphobic, sexist, and homophobic, and you need to check your privilege. Gender is not a social construct. This is an objective fact of reality. Unfortunately, with the rise of postmodernism and Western academia, many people have no problem rejecting facts which are inconvenient to their worldview because they believe objective reality to be either irrelevant or even non-existent. But this is a video for those who still believe in empirical evidence and rationalism. To those people I present, gender is not a social construct, science versus feelings. If we define gender as the sum of the numerous distinctions between male and female sexes, then yes, some aspects of gender can be considered social constructs, such as the wearing of dresses versus the wearing of pants. However, not all distinctions between the sexes are socially constructed, but have their roots in unalterable human biology. As a matter of fact, there exist physiological differences between the male and female brains which lead to different behavioral tendencies. According to Brain Differences Between Genders by Gregory L. Janssen in 2014, there exist physical differences in the way male and female brains process speech. Before boys or girls are born, their brains developed with different hemispheric divisions of labor. The left and right hemispheres of the male and female brains are not set up exactly the same way. For instance, females tend to have verbal centers on both sides of the brain, while males tend to have verbal centers on only the left hemisphere. This is a significant difference. Girls tend to use more words when discussing or describing incidents, story, person, object, feeling, or place. Males not only have fewer verbal centers in general, but also, often, have less connectivity between their word centers and their memories or feelings. When it comes to discussing feelings and emotions and senses together, girls tend to have an advantage, and they tend to have more interest in talking about these things. Gender-Related Differences in Lateralization of Hippocampal Activation and Cognitive Strategy by Frings et al. made a similar finding in 2006. Hippocampal activation was significantly more left-lateralized in women, and more right-lateralized in men. Correspondingly, women rated their strategy as being more verbal than men did. According to Sex Differences in the Human Visual System, published in the Journal of Neuroscience Research in 2017, there exist differences in the way men and women process visual information which can at least partially be explained by differences in neurology, and these differences may be related to the differences in the prevalence of autism and schizophrenia between men and women. We seek not to evaluate scientific reports of sex differences in human vision critically, but rather to show that if any single result reported here is valid, sex differences in the human visual system are undeniable. The fact that disorders such as autism and schizophrenia are more prevalent in males than in females implies that there are corresponding sex differences in visual function because these disorders are frequently associated with abnormal visual processing. Additional investigation of sex differences in the human visual system would contribute to an already considerable amount of evidence in support of sex differences in the nervous system generally, and strongly counter the traditional assumption in many fields of neuroscience research that sex differences are negligible or non-existent. According to a review on sex differences in processing emotional signals by Emmy Kret and B. de Gelder in 2012, the neurological differences between men and women are too significant to be ignored. Importantly, results show that although women are better at recognizing emotions and express themselves more easily, men show greater response to threatening cues, dominant, violent, or aggressive, and this may reflect different behavioral response tendencies between men and women as well as evolutionary effects. We conclude that sex differences must not be ignored in effective research and more specifically in effective neuroscience. According to sex differences in brain gray and white matter in healthy young adults, correlations with cognitive performance by Ruben C. Gurr et al. in 1999, there exist significant differences in the proportions of gray matter and white matter as well as cerebral spinal fluid between the brains of men and women, and these physical differences correlate to differences in cognitive performance in various tests between men and women. We confirmed that women have a higher percentage of gray matter, whereas men have a higher percentage of white matter and of cerebral spinal fluid. These differences sustained a correction for total intracranial volume. In men, the slope of relation between cranial volume and gray matter paralleled that for white matter, whereas in women, the increase in white matter as a function of cranial volume was at a lower rate. In men, the percentage of gray matter was higher in the left hemisphere, the percentage of white matter was symmetric, and the percentage of cerebral spinal fluid was higher in the right women showed no asymmetries. Both gray matter and white matter volumes correlated moderately with global, verbal, and spatial performance across groups. However, the regression of cognitive performance and white matter volume was significantly steeper in women. Because gray matter consists of the somatodendritic tissue of neurons, whereas white matter comprises myelinated connecting axons, the higher percentage of gray matter makes more tissue available for computation relative to the transfer across distant regions. 
This could compensate for smaller intracranial space in women. Sex differences in the percentage and asymmetry of the principal cranial tissue volumes may contribute to differences in cognitive functioning. The differences between male and female brains aren't just found in humans. According to Sex Differences in Response to Children's Toys and Non-Human Primates by Jerry Ann M. Alexander and Melissa Hines in 2002, male and female non-human primates also display different behavioral tendencies in the absence of human-imposed social constructs. Sex differences in children's toy preferences are thought by many to arise from gender socialization. However, evidence from patients with endocrine disorders suggests that biological factors during early development, e.g. levels of androgens, are influential. It isn't just toy preferences which are different between males and females. According to Sex Differences in Six-Month-Old Infants' Affect and Behavior, Impact on Maternal Caregiving, published by Marta Catherine Weinberg of the University of Massachusetts Amherst in 1992, human infants begin exhibiting differences in behavioral tendencies as early as six months of age, long before they have any understanding of gender identity or social expectations, and these differences cannot be accounted for by differences in interactions with their mothers. Significant between-session stability in both sexes' behavioral and affective displays was found particularly in the first play, suggesting that stress does not highlight individual differences at this age. These data indicate that boys are more effectively reactive and socially directed than girls, and that girls are more object-oriented and use more self-regulatory behaviors than boys. Thus, six-month-old infants show gender-based affective behavioral and self-regulatory differences that appear independent of maternal behavior and effect. This is just a small handful of scientific papers which demonstrate neurological differences between men and women. It seems that the scientific community roundly rejects the notion that gender is a social construct and agrees that gender identity is primarily a result of biology, even in transgender individuals. On that note, while the exact causes of gender dysphoria aren't entirely understood, it is generally believed to be caused by hormonal imbalances during prenatal development or genetic factors which lead to a brain whose physiology doesn't match up with the body's sex characteristics. Therefore, it is not a choice, but a congenital condition. I shouldn't have to point out that congenital conditions are not social constructs. Furthermore, the notion that gender is a social construct actually invalidates the existence of transgender people by reducing their gender identity to a sort of role-playing game. After all, if your gender identity is nothing more than a result of social conditioning and one can simply choose to reject those social standards, in effect choosing their gender identity, then gender identity is essentially nothing more than a preference, and you have no basis for demanding that anybody respect your pronouns because your choice of gender is no more worthy of respect than your choice of favorite color, flavor of ice cream, or pizza topping. This is why when I see somebody claiming to be transgender while at the same time arguing that gender is a social construct, I reject their gender identity as nothing more than a performance they are enacting so they can get oppression points and claim the social currency that comes with being a victim. Notice how the majority of trans trenders on Tumblr are upper middle class white teenagers who have never experienced hardship or oppression of any kind. Somebody who actually suffers from gender dysphoria would never argue that gender is a choice because for them it isn't. But that's not just the opinion of this particular cisgendered white male. Listen to what transsexual YouTuber Blair White has to say about it. So by now I'm sure you've heard that gender is a social construct. It's a common argument used by feminists, SJWs, and by otherwise intelligent people. Gender is not a social construct, it's biological, and that's just an objective truth. However, I do concede that certain aspects of gender are socially constructed. Think of boys wear blue and girls wear pink. There's nothing in our biology that leads us to this behavior, but it's important to differentiate between expectations of gender and gender itself. You don't get to say that gender itself is socially constructed just because certain aspects of the expectations of gender are socially constructed. It's very interesting to me how the same people who will say that gender is a social construct will be the same people that argue for transgenderism and who say that trans identities are legitimate. And obviously I think they are legitimate, but when you say something like gender is a social construct, what you're basically saying is that trans people are just performers of gender, that they're just behaving like the opposite gender for and giggles, rather than how their biology is fueling them to behave. Personally, I see myself as irrefutable, living, breathing proof that gender is not a social construct. I had the social construct of gender placed on me from the moment I was born in the hospital and wrapped up in a blue blanket rather than a pink one. And if it was a social construct, then I should, by all means, identify and live my life as a man, but clearly that didn't work out. So where does this idea that gender is a social construct actually come from? Well, it actually has its origin in one of the biggest cases of science fraud in history. 
In the early 1960s, a psychologist from New Zealand living in the United States named John William Money was a proponent of the theory of gender neutrality. The idea that sexual identity was the product of social conditioning and not a product of biology. That a boy could mentally become a girl and vice versa if they were raised that way. However, in order to prove this, he would need a test subject, a child who could be raised from an early age to be the opposite of their biological sex. Since every experiment needs a control, the child should have a twin sibling with an identical genome to rule out any genetic variables which may interfere with the outcome. Dr. Money would soon have a perfect opportunity. On August 22, 1965, two identical twin brothers were born in Winnipeg, Canada. The names were Brian and Bruce Reimer. At six months old, both boys were diagnosed with pathological phimosis, a condition in which the foreskin of the penis cannot retract properly and interferes with the passing of urine. It was recommended that they be circumcised to correct the problem. On April 27, 1966, the boys were prepared for a circumcision procedure using the unconventional method of cauterization. Bruce was the first to receive the operation, but something went wrong and his penis was burned beyond surgical repair. The doctors decided not to operate on his brother Brian, whose phimosis later cleared up without intervention. Bruce's parents, Janet and Ronald, took him to see Dr. Money at Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore, Maryland. There, Dr. Money recommended that since Bruce would most likely not be able to live a happy life as a boy with a disfigured penis, he should undergo gender reassignment surgery and be raised as a girl. Janet and Ronald agreed, and at the age of 22 months, Bruce's testicles were removed and he was given a rudimentary vulva and his name was changed to Brenda Reimer. Dr. Money advised them to never tell Brenda that she used to be a boy. Dr. Money would continue to observe Brenda and Brian on an annual basis for the next decade. During this time, Money maintained the anonymity of the children by reporting his experiment as the John Joan case and claimed it as a success, writing, The child's behavior is so clearly that of an active little girl and so different from the boyish ways of her twin brother. At the time, Money's claims were touted as scientific proof that gender is a social construct. However, the experiment wasn't as successful as Money claimed. Back in Canada, Brenda continued to behave in a masculine manner. She didn't want to play with her girl toys and instead preferred to play with her brother's boy toys, and despite taking female hormone supplements, her voice deepened as she matured and she preferred to urinate standing up. Money decided a more drastic solution was needed to get Brenda to accept that she was a girl, and suggested to her parents that Brenda's rudimentary vulva be surgically reconstructed into a more complete vagina. It was at this point that Janet and Ronald decided to discontinue their meetings with Money. In 1980, faced with a suicidal 14-year-old, Brenda's parents finally decided to tell her that she was born a boy. At that moment, Brenda decided that she didn't want to be a girl anymore and changed his name to David. He underwent numerous genital reconstruction surgeries, took testosterone injections, and had a mastectomy to remove the breast that he had developed as a result of the estrogen therapy. He reverted back to being a boy, and even married a woman named Jane at the age of 25 and adopted three children, becoming a husband and a father. Dr. Money's experiment was a failure. However, Money continued to flaunt his experiment as a success, and for 30 years, Money's view on the malleability of gender became the accepted standard in the medical community, under which sexual reassignment became the normal treatment for infants with deformed genitalia. But not everybody was convinced. Even in the 1970s, Dr. Milton Diamond of the University of Hawaii in Manoa was butting heads with John Money. He began a long search to track down John and Joan, and he met Dr. Keith Sigmundson, a psychiatrist who had treated David back in Canada. Through him, Diamond found out the true identity of Joan and managed to track down and meet David. What David told him was disturbing. During his time as Brenda, David's visits to Dr. Money's office were more traumatic than they were therapeutic. Money would force Brenda and Brian into sexual rehearsal play, in which he would have them pose in sexual positions with each other in order to reinforce their assigned genders. A year after Money had published his claims of success, he tried to convince David that he was a girl by showing him a book titled Two Births, which contained photos of women giving birth, something which David, still a child at the time, found shocking. In 1997, Diamond and Sigmundson published a document in the Archives of Pediatrics and Adolescent Medicine titled Sex Reassignment at Birth, A Long-Term Review and Clinical Implications, which exposed the failures of Money's experiment. This report is a long-term follow-up to a classic case in the pediatric psychiatry and sexology literature. In this case, an XY individual had his penis accidentally ablated and was subsequently raised as a female. The initial reports were that this individual was developing into a normally functioning female. The present findings show that the individual did not accept the sex of rearing, 
At puberty, this individual switched to living as a male and has successfully lived as such from that time to the present. The significant factors in this switch are presented. In instances of extensive penile damage to infants, it is standard to recommend rearing the male as a female. Subsequent cases should, however, be managed in light of this new evidence. Later in 1999, Diamond published Pediatric Ethics and the Surgical Assignment of Sex, which recommended against the practice of reassigning gender to an infant with ambiguous or destroyed genitalia, for which he was awarded the research prize by the Gender Identity Research and Education Society. Also in 1997, journalist John Calapinto published David's story in Rolling Stone, and in 2000 wrote a book about him called As Nature Made Him, The Boy Who Was Raised as a Girl, in which money's deceptions and abuses were exposed. The publications of Diamond, Sigmundson, and Colapinto have since greatly influenced the scientific understanding of the biology of gender, as well as the medical practices associated with it. Unfortunately, David's story does not have a happy ending. In 2002, David's brother Brian, having suffered from schizophrenia, committed suicide by overdosing on depression medication. In 2004, Jane asked David for a divorce, then two days later, on May 4th, David parked his car in the parking lot of a supermarket and shot himself in the head with a shotgun. He was 38 years old. Despite all of that, feminists and social justice warriors continue to insist that gender is a social construct, something which one can simply pick and choose, but this is a harmful way of thinking and is not supported by scientific evidence. So in conclusion, the idea that gender is a social construct is patently false anti-scientific nonsense, which not only trivializes gender identities by reducing them to a performance, but is even dangerous. You're always going to see people that are going to say, well, the Dave Reimer case could have been successful. Um, I'm living proof, and if you're not going to take my word as gospel, because I have lived through it, who else are you going to listen to? Who else is there? I've lived through it. Uh, like, I, is it going to take somebody to wind up killing themselves, shooting themselves in the head for people to listen? If you like this video, be sure to click the like button, share it, leave a comment, and subscribe. Also, since YouTube has decided that informational videos which don't conform to politically correct standards don't deserve ad revenue, be sure to support me on Patreon so I can justify spending the time and energy it takes to continue making videos. For those of you who already support me on Patreon, I've decided to restructure it so that you only pay when I make a new video, and I'm not talking about the stupid 2 minute videos I make in my yard and at Walmart, but real videos with time and effort put into them like this one, so if I go a month without making one, you won't feel like you're wasting your money.